So good morning and welcome. I'm Amanda Meeker, Executive Director of the California Museum. I'm so glad that you could all be with us today as we celebrate the opening of the Unity Center. It's a place to celebrate our diversity, to discover the things we have in common, and to be inspired to stand up for our rights and for the rights of others. This panel discussion today will be the first of many important conversations held as part of the Unity Center's programming. And we couldn't be starting off with a more impressive group of panelists. I'd now like to introduce our moderator, award-winning journalist Lisa Ling, host of CNN's This Is Life with Lisa Ling. Born right here in Sacramento, Lisa got her start on Channel 10's Scratch while attending Del Campo High School. She covered the Civil War in Afghanistan when she was just 21, later co-hosted ABC Daytime's hit show The View, which won an Emmy during her time there. She has been a field correspondent for The Oprah Winfrey Show and contributor to ABC News' Nightline National Geographic's Explorer. She is also an honorary board member of the California Museum. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Ling. Thank you so much, Amanda. Welcome, everyone. Unity! So as Amanda just mentioned, I am from Sacramento. This is my hometown, and I couldn't be more excited about the, the debut of this extraordinary Unity Center. Uh, Mayor Steinberg, you're here. Uh, thank you for making this happen. If, when, you, when this uh, panel concludes, please, please take the time to go through the exhibit. It is truly extraordinary. I've been emotional all morning because I don't know about you, but I've been feeling uh, pretty sick over the last few weeks um, in, in the wake of events in, in Charlottesville and, and really all year. Um, <laughs> The blatant discrimination, as we all know, at a federal level of immigrants, minorities, and members of the LGBT uh, T community. I really feel like we have taken a colossal step back. You know, the political vitriol has reached a fever pitch. Does anyone uh, go, agree with me? Are you feeling this too? <laughs> so that is why I'm so proud to be here today to launch this incredible and necessary permanent exhibit here at the California Museum. Um, this center explores California's unique role in the civil rights movement and really provides a way for all of us to get involved. And to kick off today's celebration, we have assembled the most amazing panel of lifelong activists, and I'm, I'm so honored to introduce all of them. Uh, first off is one of my heroes. She is among the most important activists in American history. You know the phrase, si se puede? That was hers. An equal partner in co-founding the first farm workers union with Cesar Chavez, she has tirelessly uh, led the fight for racial, uh, a fight against uh, racial and labor uh, abuse. She is also one of the most defiant feminists of the 20th century. There are... <laughs> There are four elementary schools named after her, and Ladies Home Journal has named her one of the 100 most important women of the 20th century. She's been awarded the Presidential Medal for, of Freedom by President Obama. She's been arrested 22 times <laughs> for participating in nonviolent civil disobedience activities, and she continues to fight peacefully at the young age of 87. Dolores Huerta, everyone. I'm truly so humbled just to be in her presence. Now, the same year that Dolores was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom, another man was posthumously honored as well. The first openly gay official in the history of California, the late, great Harvey Milk. His, 
His incredible nephew, Stuart Milk, has picked up where his uncle left off and is truly a devout human rights activist and youth advocate. He is the co-founder and executive chair of the Harvey Milk Foundation, and they just do incredible work. It's an organization that supports local, uh, regional, and national human rights efforts, uh, emerging LGBT communities on the gr uh, ground. He helps organize in over 67 countries on five continents. Stuart Milk, everyone. I love this love fest going on today. Let's continue it. Our next panelist has represented California's 30th Senate District since 2014. She chairs the Committee on Budget and Fiscal Review. During her six years in the legislature, Senator Holly Mitchell has obtained passage of law of more than 50 bills. Her legislation seeks to improve human services, expand access to health care, secure women's reproductive rights, protect the environment and the trafficking of minors, defend the civil rights of minorities and the undocumented, and above all, reduce the numbers of, of children growing up in poverty. She is a true badass and hopefully <laughs> a next governor of the state of California, Senator Holly Mitchell. And last but certainly not least, your Sacramento's 45th Chief of Police, uh, who is also the first African American to lead the department, Chief of Police Daniel Hahn. Now, Chief Hahn is a local boy. He grew up uh, in Oak Park and graduated from Sac High. His law enforcement career, however, began 30 years ago, but most recently he was Chief of Police in Roseville for six years. He holds a bachelor degree in business administration from Cal State University, Sacramento, and a master's of public administration from National University. Your police chief, Daniel Hahn. <laughs> All right, everyone. So thank you all for taking the time to be here for this extraordinary day. Uh, Dolores, I, I want to start with you because you've been advocating for farm workers, minorities, and women for decades. It's 2017. Did you ever think that you would still be having to fight this hard? Uh, I think so. <laughs> uh, yes, I think so because I remember growing up in Stockton California, not too far from here, as a youngster, and I thought, well, the discrimination that myself and my, uh, you know, fellow youth, uh, many Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, African American, uh, and the way that we were subjected to treatment, uh, you know, by the local law enforcement people and in our schools, that well, when I get to be an adult, maybe that will change. Uh, when I get to be a grandmother, that will change. And I get to be a great grandmother that will change, and it hasn't changed. I mean, I, I know we've made a lot, a lot of progress after the 60s, uh, but still we, we have these systems of oppression that are in place and they have to be taken down. Uh, one, I just wanted to say that uh, um, in addition to the bio that you just read about myself, uh, I'm now the uh, president and founder of the Dolores Huerta Foundation for grassroots organizing, which I've been doing for the last 15 years, and we just, uh, recently just won a lawsuit against the current high school district because of the discrimination <laughs> against African American and Latino children, students, you know, the high suspensions and expulsions. And so we have these systems of oppression that are in place that kind of go back uh, to the time of slavery. Uh, when we think of the recent uh, act of uh, Donald Trump uh, pardoning uh, Joe Arpaio in Arizona, Thank you, who mistreated the Latino prisoners. And, and we think, and that comes, of course, uh, all of this dominations that we are facing is because, you know, in order to justify slavery, uh, then you have to say there's something wrong with people of color, you know, with people of African descent. In order to justify discrimination against Latinos, you know, this used to be Mexico, the land that we're sitting on. <laughs> 
And in addition to that, it was the, the land of the Native Americans that have never, never ever been repaid for the land that we took from them. So to justify all of this domination and exploitation, that's why we have racism. And so that's why I think we have these systems of oppression in place. And I think that's why we have to work very hard uh, to get rid of them. And I think that's, you know, that's what we all, everybody here in this room, everybody in our country, uh, that we have to work very hard uh, to make sure that we get rid of these systems of racism, misogyny, homophobia, bigotry that exist. Stuart, uh, headline news today and yesterday, the, the Trump administration is currently working on guide, the guidelines to ban people who are transgender from the military. Tell us your, about your thoughts on that. Um, well, f first let me just say that it's great to be here, um, in particular at this museum that has been a great light, not just for Sacramento and California, but throughout the country, and in particular, this Unity Center and the type of educational work we do. And it is related to that question, because the only, so I know, I, I'm, I, 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 I think our base is with us, and so I try to message to those that are not with us yet. And so um, this transgender ban is just yet another way of placating a different base. Um, but at the end of the day, when you attack a community, you are basically because they are different, whether they're transgender, whether they're, uh, whether their color of their skin is different than the majority, whether their faith is different from the majority. When you do that, you're basically a bully. And what I want people to understand is that we have schoolyard bullies that win when they can say to one community, I'll leave you alone, the Latinx community, if you join me in attacking the LGBT community. They win when you say to the LGBT community, we'll go easy on you if you join us in attacking um, the immigrant community. They only win if we let them win. And what we have is a schoolyard bully who has a much bigger bully pulpit. Um, and we have to counter message that. When, uh, when Donald Trump says, I'm going to protect the LGBT community and starts out attacking immigrants and he, and he attacks women's right to choose and he attacks um, Mexicans and he attacks people of color. We have to remind him, I'm sorry, you cannot protect the LGBT community because we are women. We are people of color. We are Mexicans. We are immigrants. And those communities also are members of the LGBT community. And together, we can actually win. But we have to unify. Um, we have to speak out. And we, and we have to let the bully know, you're not going to get anyone to join you. So whether it's a bully on a playground or a bully on Pennsylvania Avenue, they only win if we allow them to. And we must join together. We must educate. We must educate out prejudice. That's a lifelong battle. But we must let people know that we, as a country, are unified. And diversity is our strength. It's not our weakness. And those that are different, as my uncle told me when I was 12, is the medicine that will heal, heal the world. And it's very, very important that we get that message out. We will not allow a bully on a playground or a bully in the White House win. Senator Mitchell, you have been called the moral compass of the Senate. What are the most uh, pressing issues of concern for you in this state right now? And, and which communities do you believe are at the greatest threat? All of us. All of us. And anyone who doesn't fundamentally believe that and understand that, I have a bridge to sell you somewhere. Um, you know, I think we are at an interesting point in time as Californians um, where the issues are omnipresent and in front of us every day. Every community across California is being touched by homelessness. Uh, I had a committee hearing in Sac here in the Capitol. I chaired the Budget Subcommittee on Health and Human Services and listened to a Sacramento woman 
who was brave enough and willing to tell us her, her story with her two children, with her 14-year-old son. And because he's 14, he can't go on the family side of the shelter. We have policies that once boys reach 14, they have to go to the adult male side of the shelter. And so she talked about when the weather's good, springtime, they live on the river. And when it gets cold in Sacramento, they move into her car. And she talked about having a storage unit because she works every day to dispel some of the myths some of us believe about the homeless community. She goes to work every day. And she was a victim of domestic violence. And so she's trying to hold on to the few things she had in her apartment because she knows one day she's going to get to the top of one of these waiting lists and have a place to live again. And so during school year, she goes to her uh, storage unit to wipe her children down with baby wipes because of our shelter system across this country. You can't get a shower every day. And so it's those stories I hear that I have the privilege to hear as an elected policymaker that get me up any morning, every morning and drive me to do whatever I can. Because as a mother, I can only begin to imagine what that does to your soul when that's the best you can do for your children. And so I have to say, um, recognizing that there are segments of our communities, there are pockets of our communities who don't have access to the resources they need to ensure their children's future. My staff and I had a powwow this year uh, to talk about what our vision and our plan was for this legislative year. And I realized that my six years so far in the legislature, I've been shooting for the floor. I've been trying to close funding gaps. We've been trying to rebuild and reinvest in California. And no one ever has kids and decide, I just want to guarantee them the bare minimum. We all have children. When we have children, our vision is for them to thrive and for us to give them the best we possibly can. So it changed my thinking as a policymaker. I'm not shooting for the floor anymore. I'm shooting for the best possible outcome for every child in California. And so I think all of us have to put our collective brain power and energy together to figure out how we make that happen because successful children in California is our top product, is our top commodity. Um, making sure that California continues to be the innovative state that it is, the progressive state that it is, it's going to depend on our next generation, our next uh, admissions to UC, CSU. And if we don't invest in them now, then we deserve what we get. And so I think the critical issue is making sure that all children have the resources and support they need to thrive. Chief Han, not a week goes by that we don't hear about officer-involved shootings, particularly when African-American men are concerned. As an African-American man, as a, an officer of the law, how do you feel about this and what can be done to change it? Yeah, I think um, the, the, I'm just as horrified when I see some of those on the news and especially how um, people feel towards law enforcement and the relationship we have with the community. And I think this country from the very beginning has um, been ill with this race or just differences in general. We have never done a good job with that. There are segments of our communities across our country that have never had a good relationship, a caring, trusting relationship with law enforcement. And I think it's, it's, it's a little embarrassing in that a lot of other things that uh, are ills in our country, we, we figure out and we fix and we make things better, except for that. And so uh, one of the things I think we commonly do is find very simple things to accomplish to make us all feel better. And the problem is five years later, we have the same sort of thing because we really haven't tackled the real issue. So uh, what we really need to do is start opening our minds and opening our hearts and truly listening to each other, put our self um, interests away. And so in law enforcement, that means we need to fundamentally change some of the ways we hire, so the way we interact with the community, bring the community into the police department. Have, um, I, I said in my, uh, at my swearing in, if we care less about the power that we have and who gets credit and more about the fact that everybody should feel safe and valued in our community will do much better. So when we start doing that, we start doing something.
You are the first African American chief of police here in Sacramento. Um, how much pressure do you feel? Because, uh, because I mean, it, it is constantly mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't feeling any until you asked that, but. I don't know that I feel any pressure from being black, but I do feel pressure that this is my hometown. And so I know a lot of people here, and no matter what event I go to, there's people that are literally saying to me, I'm counting on you. So as opposed to being in a town where you don't know anybody, I can't go down the street. I've lived here for my entire life. And so there's pressure in that, that if we aren't successful, then I'm letting people I've known my whole life down and um, letting people like my mom, who has really been an activist, un I unwillingly was drug around with her my whole life as she was an activist in our neighborhood. And so I really feel like I'm carrying on her work. And um, so it's pressure in that sense. Dolores, uh, to rousing applause, I mentioned that you've been arrested 22 times. <laughs> But you've also been, been injured pretty, pretty severely. Um, when is the fight worth the risk of physical harm, of arrest? When is it worth that risk? Well, when we think of the, of the martyrs, uh, you know, in, in our movements like Harvey Milk, uh, the five uh, farm workers that were killed in the farm worker movement, Nan Friedman, a young Jewish girl from Boston, who was killed in a strike in Florida, Najee Daifala, who was a second martyr, an Arab, who was killed by a deputy sheriff in, uh, in Kern County, Bakersfield. Uh, Juan de la Cruz, who was shot in the heart by a labor contractor. Heather uh, Hader, who was just Rufino Contreras, who was killed in the uh, Imperial Valley, uh, met by a hail of 80 bullets when he went into a field uh, to talk to strike breakers. And uh, none of the, by the way, all of these people were killed. Nobody went to jail for any of those killings. And the last one, Renee Lopez, a young 19-year-old. So, you know, when you think of these people that were killed uh, just trying to get basic human rights, like a toilet in the fields, rest periods, uh, cold drinking water, safety standards, the right to organize, uh, one thinks of uh, those people, and of course, people that were killed in the civil rights movement and are still being killed, uh, you know, like Heather, who was just killed in Charlottesville, and the two deputies that were also killed in that, you know, died in that incident, uh, you know, because they were there. And no, people kind of forget to mention them, and I think we have to remember them also. Uh, so you think of all of these other people that have died, the ones that were, you know, uh, Shaney, Schwerner, Goodman, uh, all of these martyrs that we have, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you know, uh, you know, going to jail and getting beaten up by the cops isn't so bad. But I, I'm glad that, I'm glad that <laughs> you know, I'm still alive, thank goodness. But I, I think that uh, the, the main thing is that to honor all of these martyrs, and, uh, and I think in, in addition, and I'm glad, Holly, that you mentioned education as being uh, one of the key issues, and I believe that we're not going to end all of this uh, racism that we have in our society until we teach children pre-K, because you know, racism starts in kindergarten, because they get it from their parents. You know, I have my, one of my uh, grandsons is Afro-Mexican, and he came home and said, they say we're different. Why are we different? And so my daughter had to explain to him, you're not, you're not different, you know what I mean? And so, uh, and we've got to you know, not, not only uh, explain to, uh, to children what the contributions have been of people of color, you know, again, Native Americans being the first slaves, the White House was built by African slaves, you know, and it was people from Mexico and Asia and uh, Japan, China, that built the infrastructure of this country. And, uh, and, you know, we've got to teach them that from the time that they're little kids so that we can end this whole issue of white privilege and uh, the children of color can have some pride in what their uh, ancestors did to build this country. And then I believe in science, okay? Have you seen that Nacho Libre movie? I believe in science and, uh, you know, and also remind people we are on one human race. We only have one human race. We have a lot of different nationalities and a lot of different cultures. We have one human race, Homo sapiens, and our human race began in Africa. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we can say to uh, David Duke and the KKK and the alt-right and the White Citizens Council, Tea Party people, you know who you are. Get over it. You're Africans. That's the tweet for the day. Get over it. You're African.
by the way, Dolores was mentioning education for pre-K. That's why this Unity Center is so phenomenal because it's so interactive. And you know, I grew up in Carmichael, California. It wasn't exactly the most diverse community uh, in, in the county at the time. And I wish I had a place like this. Um, and you'll see when you go through it, it is, is a place that you need to bring your kids. Um, Stuart, we talked about the, the ban on transgender uh, people in the military, but how secure are LGBT rights right now in this country? Well, LGBT rights um, are no different than any other minority group. Um, we are always at the potential tyranny of the majority. I mean, that's what we have a constitution for. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson famously was asked, when does the battle for liberty and justice end? He said it doesn't. It requires vigilance. And so um, it's no different for the LGBT community. We sometimes forget that in the West, um, that two thirds of the world, the LGBT community live where they're either their existence is criminal or there's no societal acceptance. And in 12 countries, it's still punishable by death. Um, we had the world's largest democracy go backwards two years ago. So one out of every six people on earth are now live in a country where LGB have been recriminalized, not T. And by the way, not T because the transgender community, what they call third gender in India, are known. They're visible. Um, and that's another risk for the LGBT community. Unlike many other minorities, we have this difficult process. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you grow up in San Francisco or you grow up in Boise you have this difficult choice to make to come out. It's a difficult kitchen table conversation. In cities like New York and San Francisco, we still find LGBT youth to be four times more likely to be homeless and six times more likely to uh, have suicidal ideation. So there's still something going on that we're not doing right. But I think it's really vitally important that we we as a minority group make sure that we're banning with other minority groups. Um, and this is what those that are against not just LGBT rights but other minority rights, they want to divide us. And it's very, very important. Uh, Victor Ubin is the poster child of that. So all you have to do is look at Hungary. Uh, Hungary built a wall. Hungary took the constitution of that country away from its constitutional courts. I mean, uh, and, and this is people currently on Pennsylvania Avenue look at Hungary with, uh, with glee. And so it's really, really important that we look at history, that we learn from history. Um, my uncle's reason for taking those bullets, his courage that he got was that he knew that if we could destroy the mask that people are forced to wear, and people knew us, whether you're an immigrant, whether you're LGBT, whether you're a person of a faith that's not part of the majority. If we are known, all the lies and myths and innuendos that are told about us get taken down. And it is that visibility. And so that's what's so exciting about this Unity Center, is that you have this great ability to interact. Education is really the key. Um, we have countries where we have LGBT rights enshrined in law, but the LGBT community is still victimized. So it's not just legal, it is societal. And we all play a role. We are all empowered. So whether you're standing up for someone in a corporate boardroom or on a school playground, this is our power. This is where the LGBT community will join other minority communities in not moving backwards. So it doesn't matter at the end of the day who is speaking as an elected leader of a country. We are really the leadership and we can take that back. Senator uh, Mitchell, if you, I wanna see if you can kind of give us a window into the, the, the political system for a sec. Cause I, I mentioned you've been considered the, the moral compass of the Senate. Um, and you voted against your party on a number of occasions. If you felt that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that this disenfranchised people would suffer, how hard is that to do given how important party loyalty is? I'm glad Mayor Steinberg is now Mayor Steinberg and not pro Tim Steinberg. <laughs> 
as I give this answer. Um, I deeply appreciate your introduction. And the reality is, uh, my mother was an OG badass. <laughs> and I'm a baby badass. I'm trying every day to, to live up to uh, what my community needs me to be. Um, and I uh, ran for office mid-career. Um, I worked here in the legislature, I lobbied, I ran a large nonprofit organization and got mad enough to decide to run, to bring my kind of real life experience to the policy making arena. And when I did that, um, I realized that I was kind of at a point in my life where I had kind of made that transition to uh, baby badass and that um, I was stepping away from a career uh, and an organization I loved that I had been the CEO of for going on 10 years. And so if I was going to do that, then I needed to make this transition and make decisions every day that I know fundamentally are in the best interest of the one million Californians I serve and the broader population who I've made my policy priority and have really focused my life's work on. Um, so if you're gonna step out there, run for office, uh, uh, be um, subject to public opinion about uh, whether I, it's appropriate for me to have locks, uh, how can I be an elected official as a single parent, uh, oh, she's tall. Uh, why is she wearing, you know, those shoes? If I'm going to subject myself, because as a woman running for office, that's what we're subjected to. If I was going to subject myself to that, step out of my private life to be a leader on a statewide front, then I needed to be able to do it and get something out of it for me and for my community. So having said all that, and people ask me the question, how hard is it? It's not hard. Um, because I am committed to a, a philosophy and a set of principles that guided my decision to run. Um, I appreciate partisan politics, and most days I get along well with others. <laughs> but the reality is, um, uh, leading ain't easy, and all of us need for people to step up and be, have a willingness to lead on our behalf. When are you going to run for governor is what I really want to know. <laughs> you nobody, Please. nobody wants that job. <laughs> so, you know, and it's not that I walk into those decisions blindly or cavalierly. Uh, it's a calculation. I get that. Um, but as Ms. Huerta said, people have gone before me, have died. And if I am not willing to exert a little political capital and put my shoulder to the grindstone and step up on issues that are important, then I don't deserve the seat or the title that I've been given. I just don't. Chief Han, um, what can we do? What needs to be done to heal the distrust of police? Well, first of all, any more disagreements, call me. I, I'll, I'll protect you. <laughs> uh, I, I think what I said earlier is, is really what needs to be done. If you think about who you trust in your own personal life, it's going to be people that you've known for a while, that you've probably gone through good times and bad times with, and so you trust them. And so law enforcement in the community should be no different. It should be people, uh, the community and law enforcement have gone through things and have grown to trust each other. But part of that means we have to share power. We have to allow the police, the police and community to be integrated to each other. We need to uh, have understanding of what each other goes through. So I often see community doing the same things that we do in law enforcement, get really defensive, go back into our trenches and not want to give an inch. The community does that too. And uh, so we have to understand each other. The community has to understand this is a dangerous job. Officers go through a lot of things. But we also have to admit that we can be better. The fact that people exhibit every day this huge level of frustration means it didn't just start yesterday. It's been building in generation after generation after generation. And, and we have to understand that and feel like there's a need to do better. And so I think we integrate community into the police department so they understand what we do and how the, the, the 
tough things that officers have to deal with and also allow them some decision making to assist us with decision. How would you like officers to act in your community? What kind of training do you think we should have? We should, we should involve them in the use of force training and things that are taught in the academy because I like to think of myself as a community person, as a father, as a son, and all those things long before I think I'm a police officer. But I have been a police officer for 30 years, and that has an impact on me. And so sometimes I don't see things because I'm looking through an officer's lens, whereas a community person might see that and be able to hit me to some other way of doing something. And we have to be willing to do that. The community has to be willing to do that, and law enforcement has to be willing to do that. Um, you all are lifelong activists civil rights activists. Was there a particular moment or experience that propelled you to want to, to stand up for other people or to become that advocate for others? Was there any one moment? Dolores? Well, I think I was very fortunate uh, uh, growing up again in Stockton that I was invited to a house meeting with a great human being named Fred Ross Sr. People here in the audience might know him. I always say a lot of people don't know who he is because he was such a great organizer. <laughs> Uh, because uh, the, the idea of an organizer is that you empower other people. And Fred Ross is the one who found Cesar Chavez uh, in San Jose. He found me in Stockton at this house meeting and really showed us with pictures about what people can do when they're organized and the great changes that, that they can make in their community. Uh, getting the first Latino elected to the city council of Los Angeles, Eduardo Roybal. Uh, excuse me, but sending police to prison for beating up Mexican-Americans and African-Americans, right? And uh, so, and also uh, instilling in me, although being born in New Mexico, my father was an assemblyman in the state of New Mexico, uh, in my family we always registered to vote. But then also, um, you know, kind of emphasizing the importance that the way that you change things, when it comes right down to it, you can do all the marches that you want, you can do all the protests that you want, but if you don't vote, nothing changes. That's the only way that we can actually get the policy changes. And so when I met uh, Mr. Ross, and uh, he taught us how to organize communities, and I did that in Stockton, and that's where I met Cesar, and then uh, we started uh, organizing a farm workers union using the same method that Fred taught us with house meetings. The same methods that I used at my organization, the Dolores Huerta Foundation today, to organize parents so they can you know, step up to their school districts and so they can get the kind of infrastructure that they need in their communities and, uh, and with our LGBT uh, program that we have also uh, to kind of raise the consciousness of the people that we work with about uh, gay rights and about women's reproductive rights. So it's kind of the grassroots, uh, you know, one on, well, I, I'm going to say not, not one on one, but one on a few people uh, to educate them and organize them. And the thing is that it really does work. You know, it really does work. And well, we organize our people both 15% higher than the rest of the county. And so we know that it works. And it's, it's just about people, power, people doing the things that need to be done. And to me, that was my magic moment when I met this great human being, who, by the way, is in this Hall of Fame here, here at this museum. Thank you. Stuart, I think I, I know what, uh, what the moment was, but was there a moment for you that, that propelled you to say, okay, I need to do something? Well, actually, you may not. Um, uh, so my conversations with my uncle were very much, he really, even though he says he knew I was gay, he actually never talked about that with me. It was more about my differences. But my real aha moment actually happened in 1985. Um, I was involved in the women's rights movement, uh, mainly because I had an experience at, my, at 18 speaking out on LGBT rights. I was compared to my uncle, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm going to be compared to Harvey. I'm <laughs> moving into the women's rights movement. But, <laughs> but women, <laughs> where I could hide. But women, um, obviously, I mean, every, you know, we, we have women in our lives who couldn't understand why women weren't treated equally, and so we got involved with the National Women's Political Caucus and ERA. And in 1985, I got to go to the closing conference of the UN Decade for Women in Nairobi, Kenya. And um, I was 25 years old. It was my first time across the Atlantic. And I was in Africa, and most people in that room of 3,000 had my color skin. And there was a woman who would be, go on to become my friend who opened that conference. There were 3,000 people. There was so much noise. 
and she could barely fit above the podium. She's an Aboriginal leader from Australia. Her name is Lilla Watson. And she got up there and she said, if you have come here because you want to support women, if you've come here because you want to help people of color, if you've come here because you want to help indigenous people, pack up your bags, go home. And that room that had been buzzing, you could hear a pin drop and mouths were open. She said, let me be perfectly clear. If you've come here because, for altruistic reasons, you want to help women, you want to help people of color, you want to help indigenous people, go home. We have nothing to do together. But if you have come here because you understand that your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. Very profound. And she went on to describe that we should be doing work not from altruistic points of view. We should be doing it from our self-interest because self-interest is a more powerful motivator. It is not in our self-interest that anyone is marginalized or discriminated against anywhere in the world. It's not in our self-interest. And so that was my moment because to be honest with you, I went there because I wanted to help women. And and so she was not just talking to those 3,000 self-important people there, she was talking to me as well. And so from that day on, I've decided that I would never be out there helping anyone, I would be out there helping myself because I knew that that was the most important motivator. And if you look at today, if we could get everyone to understand that it's in our self-interest to stand up for those who, who, are, who are in any way taken having their rights taken away, are in any way being discriminated against, who are in any way having prejudicial hate put upon them. If we could always see that, that this is not in our self-interest, we could change the face of humanity. And so that was my, my aha moment. And, and, and the beautiful end piece of that is that Lilla Watson, as an Aboriginal leader, um, you, can, you can Google her name, you'll see that that quote, she refuses to take credit for it because as an Aboriginal community, she believes that we do not create anything as an individual that it's part of the collective and it belongs to the collective. So if we can just take from this Unity Center and from the work that we're doing here that it's not in anyone's self-interest to have anyone in any way a victim of discrimination. Senator Mitchell. You, was there an aha moment for you? So, you know, I think that's why the Unity Center is so important because you never know what experience will expose particularly a young person. Uh, I, in search of affordable housing, my family moved from L.A. to Riverside my eighth grade year. And I remember my mother reading in the Riverside Press Enterprise that the uh, Riverside Big Public Library was going to show Birth of a Nation. And it had been touched up and updated and, you know, fixed. <laughs> and she said, well, we're going to go. And I was like, what is, well, oh, I have to go where with you and why? <laughs> eighth grade, you know how it is. And we walked in, um, and we were the only people of color in an auditorium of about 300 people. And we sat up toward the front. And about midway through, she said, get up, we're leaving. And we turned around, and it really was like a theatrical moment. We walked down the middle aisle of this theater with the image, with the, so we, we walked in the middle of the projector. <laughs> and these two black women walking out of Birth of a Nation. And at 14, I thought, it, it occurred to me that whoever you are and wherever you are, you can choose to lead and set an example. Fast forward a couple of years, uh, I'm in high school in Riverside, and the Klan rides on our campus, and they leaflet the campus. Well, we're on in class, you get out of class, you see the leaflets, and what do high school kids do? We fight. Fights break out. The only student um, um, that was going to be expelled was African American. Uh, my mother goes, organizes, folks show up at the school board meeting to talk about why this one particular student, when fights broke out campus-wide, 
was not going to be the only one expelled if there was going to be some expulsions. Again, it taught me that wherever you are, whether you know the person, whether there's a direct connection, we have a responsibility and an obligation to be an advocate when you see bias and justice uh, being violated. And so when I think, I'm glad you asked the question because it forced me to go back and really recognize that those were two very powerful moments in my life that have left lifelong impression on me that I think really have guided and dictated who I've become, the kind of woman I am and the kind of parent I am. And again, why places like the Unity Center are so important to create opportunities, perhaps when you least expect it, for learning and exposure and thought. Yep. Chief, do you have a moment? Uh, no, I don't have an aha moment. I have an aha person. And so that would be my mother who would often march up and down Broadway to protect uh, the women that would walk the streets against the pimps and the, um, the Johns, against the drug dealers. She would take people into the house. She would help people that couldn't help themselves. And so I resisted that all growing up and thought, uh, you know, being drugged to meetings and, and things like that. But um, I think it was sinking in the whole time. And so I've always um, been taught, even though we didn't really talk about it, to do for others. And so as I think back all my life, that's what I've always done, even though I didn't really know I was doing it. And so often people think the aha moment, you mentioned Ms. Huerta has been arrested several times. Well, I was arrested at 16 for assault on an officer, and people usually think <laughs> that that was my aha moment, but it wasn't. It, I mean, that was, it was an aha, aha moment for other things, but not for that. Uh, but so I think it was just uh, watching my uh, mom because one of the things that happens all the time, and it's happened a lot in the last couple of weeks, that when people find out who my mom is, it raises me up. So, because people know my mom and they know her heart. And if I'm her son, I must be pretty good. And so... That's the pressure you're under. Yeah, yeah. And, and the senator mentioned it earlier. When you have a position of leadership and a position of power, you can't just sit on your hands. You have to do something. And so I, I go home literally every night and look in the mirror and say, can I look myself in the mirror? Because those decisions are hard. And it affects a lot of people. There's never a decision that somebody's not really angry. And power is, is in my opinion, the most powerful drug. And when, when you're forcing people to give some of that up, they'll fight you tooth and nail. And so... Two things, I, I look in the mirror every night to see if I can live with myself, regardless of what happened during the day, if five people are after me or not. And then two, I want my wife and I to be the exact same thing my mom was to me for our two daughters. I want, when people find out who their mom and dad is, that it lifts them up. And I can't do that by selfish things. I have to do that by helping our community come together. <laughs> I have a, a couple questions from the audience that I'd like to ask, but, but before that, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you all about your suggestion to reduce this tension in the air that's been persisting for the last few months. Um, there's so much anger and vitriol being spewed on both sides. It's clear we're probably not going to be able to reach common ground, but can we get and can we have a civil discourse? How, how would that be achievable, Senator? I think the first thing people need to do is own your own stuff. Amen. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, online now. You can take these amazing implicit bias tests. AAUW has one on gender, and Harvard University has one on, on everything you can imagine. Because we all have bias. And to acknowledge that, and it's not, you know, I'm perfect, you're the one with the issue. I, you know what I mean? And so I think if everyone, in the privacy of your own home, took the implicit bias chat test to understand that we all have bias and begin our self-work, everybody, um, I think that's an important first step and one tangible thing everybody here can do check ourselves because we all have bias based on the lens through which we see the world, based on the treatment we've experienced, based on media impressions of other people that we buy into, whether we're conscious of it or not. 
whether you know your best friend is black or not. We all have bias, and I think the first place we need to begin the dialogue is to own it and make a decision about what am I going to do to check myself. Anyone else have any suggestions on how to, to ignite some civil discourse amidst all of this tension? Uh, well, I think that we all have a responsibility and uh, I do believe that people can change, but I think it takes them a long time to change, uh, you know, for them to come to the realization of what their biases are. Um, and, but I think in the meantime, while we get there, that we have to do policy changes. For instance, in the South, uh, to be able to get people the right to vote. You know, it, 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 you couldn't have done that without the civil rights movement. And it wasn't until they had policy changes that, that made that happen. So I think the one thing that we can do, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go back to my mantra, I guess, about, about people getting involved, engaging themselves uh, in political activity. And I say do this even in your, in your party. You know, if it you're a Democrat or Republican or a Green or whatever, independent, get involved in your political party so that we can get progressive people elected. Uh, you know, so that we can get people that are going to fight uh, to make sure that we can erase all of these isms that we've been talking about. And and this is something that we can do because we, uh, it, as a as a citizen that votes, you know, we do have that power. And people don't realize that we have that power, but it's not going to happen by a, a sitting uh, sitting around and wishing that it would that it, can, it would happen. And, you know, we do have uh, some democratic uh, uh, actions that we can take, and one of them is just being there, present in a meeting, being there uh, to be able to vote to see who's going to be elected uh, to head up this democratic central committee that you might uh, belong to, and definitely uh, on those school boards. Let's get people elected to those school boards. That are gonna, it's not enough to, talk, to teach about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You have to talk about Emmett, Kill, uh, Emmett Till and the way he was killed, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and Harvey Milk. And, uh, you know, we have to take over the school board, but it's not going to happen unless people are willing to take that time. In my organization, I wish that you could see some of the, uh, um, one of our uh, people that we got elected to a water board, she's a maid in a hotel. Uh, another woman is a farm worker. She got elected uh, to this position on, on, on the water board, and right away she started uh, investigating the manager that they had just hired, and he had been fired from another uh, place for embezzlement. So she took him out. And then uh, she started going through the bank records and found out that there was a quarter of a million dollars missing from the small water board. And so right away, uh, uh, good to know that a couple of months ago they arrested the clerk of the water board, okay, as a suspect. I don't know whether she's guilty or not. But the thing is, this woman, if you would see her, her name is Leticia Prado. She speaks very broken English, probably never went to high school or to college, but she's got a brain. Yeah. And, and you know, she's got the commitment there. And so this is what we have to do. I think we have to work at the local level, at the school board level, city council level, definitely our state legislatures. But we've got to take the power, folks. You know, basically, we've got to take the power and we've got to work to make it happen, otherwise it's not going to happen. Things will continue, because this discrimination that we've all faced has been going on for, as we know, for decades and generations. And uh, we have to say, ya basta, you know. We're through with it, it's time to act, and we've, uh, every single one of us has got to get engaged at the public level, at the private level, to say it's bringing our country down, you know, as the leaders of the free world, you know, 75% of the world is people of color. 25% of them are occasion. We've got to end this because it's going to destroy our society. I have a question from the audience. What are talking points that will actually get through to people who are unable to recognize the existence of systemic racism? Any talking points? Well, I mean, first of all, I think the key point is talking. I remember there's a great last interview that my uncle had um, before he defeated um, Prop 6 in California, um, which would have banned LGBT people from teaching. And he was asked in this uh, last TV interview that he had before he was assassinated, you know, he said, they said, people are angry. Um, and he said, no, they're not. And she, the host said, people are, 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 are hateful. And, are, and he said, no, they're not. He said, it's been packaged and sold that way, but people are not hateful, people are not angry. And if we have conversations with them, 
we can break through. I mean, one of the things that my uncle, the reason he got so many death threats is that he went out. I mean, I, I got, have a letter from him framed and hanging in my house that, you know, he said, he wrote me a letter saying uh, when he was running for office, you know, I went out and spoke to a thousand people that hated me and I left and 998 people hated me. And I was a young, <laughs> you know, I was like, I remember calling him and I said, I don't understand, I got this crazy letter from you. What are you so excited about? But he said, um, he said, well, those two will become four and the four will become eight and the eight will become 16. He said, I go to all the places where people hate me because I know I can reach them. We have to try. And, um, and I think one of the talking points is to not shout at each other and to put down our own prejudices. So when you see someone with a ridiculous stance to look at them as a human being and find a way to reach them. You just shared a story with me, Lisa, about being on the plane with a Trump supporter and, 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 and having a conversation about the type of language coming out of this president and them agreeing with you. But we have to be able to do that. Just shouting at each other doesn't move us ahead. Having conversations with each other does. And so one of the things, uh, talking points to take away is to have those conversations, to go into the community. I mean, look, I've traveled the world and I go where there's emerging and struggling LGBT communities in particular. And I've had conversations with people who have just thrown urine and feces at me and I will still go and talk to them and find a way to reach them because we have to do that. That's what my uncle taught me. He said, you gotta go not to the chorus, you know, definitely keep the chorus going, but go to those that are not on board and try to reach out to them. And I think we've got a mechanism here in Sacramento to do that. Yeah, I think to add something to that, I think there's, a, there's obviously there's no one solution. There's, it's very complicated, but I think part of it is to prove it to people. And the senator mentioned it earlier, that there's implicit bias. There's a young lady in the audience, Cassandra Pai, that does a great job with this in Sacramento. But there's, there's scientific evidence of how your brain works and how you come to these things through implicit bias that I don't think anybody that could go through that could deny that. And I think those are some of the things we have to start doing is proving it to people. Because when you're in the powerful position, you don't see a lot of things. You're like, what's wrong? You guys go to school now. You guys can get jobs. It's your fault that you're not rising up to the top. When in reality, oftentimes, there's barriers there. And so I think part of our responsibility as a community is to prove it to people. Senator, any talking points? Well, God's not through with me yet. <laughs> so I'm... <laughs> You all have to just hold me and make sure that I can go into the place and have these conversations. Um, I think that's why the Unity Center is important. You know, I think my, my aha moment once I was elected, which um, really hit me deep, is that I can't legislate morality. Um, and so it is going to be critically important that we find places and spaces to have constructive conversation. And it's not at rallies and protests um, because violence ensues. And so how do we do that? Uh, I made the conscious decision as a parent to live in a community, to have friends that reflect my rhetoric. And so the people who came to our home for dinner the places we, the, the homes we went to for dinner. My son not being quite sure why there was such a reaction when he decided to go to Saturday Swedish school with the kids two houses down. Um, and yet, making sure he also fundamentally understands how he is perceived by the world. And so when law enforcement stopped him in the park walking home midday and asked where you're going and he's like, I have a backpack on, clearly home from school, it's having those conversations and being clear, but, be, but creating spaces and places to have the conversation and to be examples to our children, not just to talk about it, but to live it so they get it intrinsically about the kind of California, the kind of country we are trying to build and create for them. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the way that we can describe what's happening in our country, I call it abysmal ignorance. Just ignorance, and I think that's where 
prejudices come from. And, and fear. Well, the ignorance, I think, creates the fear. And I think an, an integration, I think, is so crucial. I mean, I, I am so grateful that I grew up in Stockton, California, you know, with all of the different ethnic groups of, that I grew up with. And, uh, and when people don't know each other, then I think that that's where the, uh, the, you know, sort of the fear comes from. Because when you know somebody and you know their story, and that's kind of interesting, too, uh, when we think about what's happening in Arizona, now in Texas, where they want to ban ethnic studies from schools. Well, if people don't know our stories, then how can they respect us? Uh, how can kids respect themselves? And so, again, I think we've just got to get this knowledge in there. And yes, tell people your stories because, and I can think of, again, in Bakersfield, we have a lot of poor white kids over there too that are really suffering also. And, and, and again, you know, we go, go back to the whole issue of jobs, and I like to say that uh, there's a lot of talk about not enough jobs for people, but you know, uh, Obama had a full employment program that he tried to pass on the Congress that the Republican Congress would not pass, you know? And so I think a, a, a lot of these uh, ills that we have in our society is people just don't know what's going on. They, you know, they're not tuned in, they don't know what's happening. And so somehow we've gotta get people to become civically engaged, not only at the national level, but at the local level. And, and, and truly. There may not be a better place to do that than this this Unity Center. I, I, I mean it. I mean, when you go through it, you you will be able to learn how to get engaged, and, and it's extraordinary. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I could sit here for hours and listen to all of you, but I just want to thank you for your wisdom, and thank you for standing up for all of us. Dolores Puerta. Oh, oh and yeah. I, I'm going to mention it. I'm gonna I, mention before it. people walk out, I just want to... Oh, no, I'm going to mention it. I'm okay, going to mention good, it. You. Stuart Milk, <laughs> Senator Holly Mitchell, mm -hmm. and, and Chief Daniel Hunt. A couple things. Spend some time in the museum. At noon, Mayor Steinberg is going to give a talk. Please listen to him. And on September 1st, the most extraordinary documentary is going to hit theaters called Dolores. <laughs> and <laughs> I was only able to share a fraction of her bio, but this woman is a, a hero and a legend. Go see that movie, okay? But could I have permission yes, to do yes. one thing? I just want to do one little thing here. Take a second, okay? I'm going to ask everybody in the audience, I'm going to ask you who's got the power, and I want you to say, we've got the power. <laughs> and when I say what kind of power, I want you to shout out people power. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Who's got the power? We have the power. What kind of power? People, people power. Who's got the power? We have the power. What kind of power? People power. Si se puede. <laughs>